There are all kinds of weird people in the world, but the deadliest ones are those that are evil in their own way. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Today, we will have a detailed look at such a devil who is not around anymore. Thank God. John Wayne Gacy, a serial killer who found it amusing to kill people, a bloodlusty animal, a bisexual maniac who brutally murdered 33 people, which was most killings by a single man at the time. The guy was a living devil. He was actually a socially liked person. He was well known in his town because of the small businesses he used to manage. Moreover, to add a little dramatic touch to the story, he used to dress as a clown on weekends to entertain the children. At one point, he reportedly was heard saying quite amusingly that clowns can get away with murder like it's nothing. Well, it was actually nothing for this devil to get away with all those murders. When his little killing spree was revealed, all the real and professional clowns lost their jobs as mothers and children were afraid to get near to a clown. Of course, how would they know if the clown is the funny clown or the killer clown? Killer clown is not just a term I used. Back in the time of Gacy, he was being referred to as the killer clown in his town. John the Killer Clown Gacy, they said. It was the 21st of December, 1978. Authorities came to Gacy's house with a search warrant. He was accused of murder and sexual assault too, but he had no proofs against him. He was then caught red-handed dealing the marijuana. Authorities saw this as a golden opportunity and the court issued a search warrant to his house. Upon doing some search in the house, they started digging his crawl space and the very first shovel that they dug, they realized that they were standing in the devil's yard. They pulled out body after body from there. All poor young men were the target of Gacy's amusement. Gacy was an American serial killer and rapist who took the lives of at least 33 young men in Cook County, Illinois, burying most under his own house. Other bodies were recovered from the nearby Des Plaines River. But the story of this killer clown doesn't start from here. It started back in 1942. John Wayne Gacy was born on the 17th of March, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. The second of three children, Gacy had a very difficult upbringing. He was not like any ordinary kid out there. And this was very much due to his father. Yeah, parents have a very solid effect on their children. The way they bring them up can make them either a saint or a devil. And Gacy was no doubt worse than the devil himself. Gacy's father was an alcoholic. He used to have very abusive behavior towards his children as well as his wife both physically, mentally, and emotionally. After all, how sane can an alcohol abuser be? Anyone's mental health will be totally distorted after being used to living in a house where you have an alcoholic father. Gacy's father spent most of his time with his son Gacy degrading him, telling him he was worthless, beating him up and constantly torturing him whatever ways he could find to torture. Gacy's childhood friend Barry Bashelli describes his memories of how Gacy's father used to treat Gacy. Barry says, If Gacy came just two minutes late, there was no food for Gacy. His father won't let him eat just because he didn't come on time. So Gacy had to eat at our house and eventually spend the night at our place. Gacy's father used to take Gacy to the kitchen, make him sit at the kitchen table, and used to punch him in his face with his fist. Gacy's father was a very prominent factor in how Gacy spent his life and the path he chose to follow and all the devilish deeds he did. Maybe deep down he was trying to satisfy his father, which he couldn't. He was beaten repeatedly by his father by belts, by brooms, and whatnot. All of these sufferings made Gacy a heart patient at a very young age. Due to his heart condition, he couldn't take part in any physical activity. Boys his age used to play all the time in the streets and in school, but Gacy was too ill and too traumatized that he never felt like doing anything, which made him feel better. Gacy was 11 years old when life hammered another nail in the coffin for him. He was trying to take a swing when the chain of the swing clipped and made him fall down so hard that he blacked out and made him a regular visitor at the hospital afterwards. By 1966, 24 years old Gacy was married and he had relocated to the city of Waterloo, 300 miles west of Chicago, in the neighboring state of Iowa. By now, Gacy didn't appear to be a troublesome person to anyone. At least from the outside, Gacy was a very normal person. He had a very good job. He was living a very happy life with his wife. His wife had two children. The couple appeared to be the typical cereal box American nuclear family. Not only that, Gacy was quite a figure in the local community. He was well known in his neighborhood and he was liked by everyone. Gacy had almost built a perfect life for himself, but the dark secret that he was carrying inside was eating him alive. He found himself getting attracted to young boys. Gacy started using his power of trust to lure young boys in his trap and then getting his unhealthy sexual desires fulfilled. 
The first time he did this was with the son of the fellow JC member. He lured the kid to his home and sexually assaulted him. The kid told his father about everything, and ultimately Gacy was arrested for it. Gacy tried to get away with it and hired another teenager to lure this kid and beat him up and spray Mason his and do whatever he could do to make him not testify against Gacy. Well, Gacy's little plan backfired and the kids testified, but there was no solid proof of the attack, so Gacy was only charged with sodomy of the 15-year-old boy. Gacy actually pleaded guilty to sodomy, thinking that he would get away with a very minimal charge, but this move backfired too. The judge didn't favor Gacy at all and gave him a 10-year sentence in prison. On the 3rd of December 1968, Gacy was sent to Anamosa State Penitentiary. While Gacy was in prison, his wife divorced him. He didn't get over his divorce when he received the news of his father's death. No matter how harsh his father was to him, blood is always thicker than water. Gacy was heartbroken due to his father's death. The authorities didn't even let him attend his dad's funeral. Gacy had a very unique quality that he could groom anyone who came into his premises. His personality was so moving that within months Gacy was the head cook of the prison. He had convinced every single person in that prison into believing that Gacy is the ideal kind of person. Due to his moving nature, he successfully tricked the authorities into believing that he's not a trouble anymore and he's now a changed man. How could authorities have known that they were going to unleash a beast in society? Nevertheless, Gacy only enjoyed 18 months of his 10-year sentence and in June 1970, the 28-year-old Gacy was released on parole. Gacy didn't get into a line of work where any kind of background check was necessary. He ran his own business, so people were unaware of the criminal background he had. In June 1972, Gacy got married for the second time. He and his new bride set up their home in the Chicago suburbs at 8213 West Summerdale Avenue, an address which would eventually become one of the most infamous addresses of America. Fast forward to 1978, when Gacy's adventures took a sharp turn and stunned everyone. Just 10 miles from Gacy's house, a 15-year-old Des Plaines resident named Rob Pist was reported missing by his mother. Two detectives, Mike Albrecht and Dave Hackmeister, were assigned the task to solve the case and find Rob, but Rob was nowhere to be found. Rob was the ideal kid. He was ideal in almost every aspect. He was the kind of kid that anyone would wish to have as a son. He had no bad reputation, never been in any trouble, good in studies, good in sports, no drugs or girlfriend issues, well-groomed and mannerable kid. All his good traits made it impossible to believe that the kid might have run away from the house, so it was certain that the kid was either kidnapped or killed by now. At the time of disappearance, Rob was working at a pharmacy. Last time he was seen with his mother, and according to her mother, he asked her to wait in the car while he went out the back door to talk to a contractor, who had offered him a high-paying job. And just like that, Rob never came back. It seemed like Rob just ghosted in thin air. But the detectives tried to track down the contractor, as he should have been the last person who might have seen Rob. After a lot of searching, they finally got an address to the contractor's house. They knocked on the door and guess who answered it? John Wayne Gacy. That's right, Gacy was the contractor who had offered a high paying job to Rob. Gacy had divorced his second wife as well back in 1976 and he used to live alone. He had an ongoing successful business by the name of PDM Contractors. Gacy often used to offer a good job in his business to young men one of which was 16 years old Tony Antonucci. Tony is still alive and healthy. He said in an interview that, When I first met Gacy, I was 16 years old. Like a normal teenager, I wanted to have a good job so I could afford to have my own car. My first impressions of Gacy were that he was a likable guy. He was kind of humorous and liked to joke around. Both Tony and Rob were 16 years old at the time when they met Gacy, but unfortunately Rob is not alive today. The detectives Mike and Dave dug down really deep in the sudden vanishing of universally liked kid Rob. When they found out that Gacy is the contractor, they started pulling some files on him and all of a sudden they found out his criminal record. They found out that he had spent some time in Iowa for sexual charges against children and young men. This was too miraculous to be a coincidence that the guy Rob met before disappearing happens to be a child sexual abuser. The detectives didn't take it as a coincidence either and they requested the court to issue a search warrant for his house. The request to issue the warrant was made on three facts. Number one fact was that Gacy was in fact present at the pharmacy on the night when Rob went missing from the pharmacy. Fact number two was that Rob told people that he was going to see a contractor regarding a job. Fact three was the criminal background of Gacy. Considering all these facts, the court issued a search warrant to Gacy's house. On the 13th of December 1978, police searched Gacy's house. Their warrant and their efforts didn't go in vain as they found a number of suspicious items in Gacy's house. The police recovered various items of pornography, 
some books which were titled Pretty Boys Must Die, various driver's license of other young people, and when they checked on those licenses, it was revealed that all those kids were reported missing as well. Things were going pretty much against Gacy. Another item recovered from Gacy's house was a high school ring, which had belonged to a missing 19-year-old boy named John Sheck, last seen in January 1977. Further investigation revealed that two of Gacy's employees also were reportedly missing. A 17-year-old John Bukovich, last seen in July 1975, and Gregory Godzik, who was also 17 years old, last seen in December 1976. After the house search, the cops were getting confident that Gacy is the guy who's made Rob disappear. And not only Rob, but police were convinced that there are at least five or six people who were victims that were associated with Gacy. All these suspicions and accusations were indeed suspicions and accusations. Police found no logical evidence or bodies to make an arrest on Gacy, but they didn't back out, and they decided to run surveillance on Gacy. The surveillance is the part where Gacy went really ahead of the cops. Cops used to follow him everywhere and used to watch his house 24-7. But Gacy knew all the time that he's being watched, so he didn't do anything stupid. He was so clever that he initiated conversations with the cops and became a fairly friendly character for the cops. The cops knew that Gacy was the culprit. Gacy knew that the cops were after him, but still cops couldn't find evidence and Gacy continued to tease the cops. He would play games with the police. He would go up to their cars and say, Hi, do you guys want marijuana or some other stupid stuff? He was really on the mission to mess with the cops. Gacy had a psychopathic personality, so he really did seek out power and control, and he liked playing with people. He was a bit of a puppet master, and these were the exact reasons which were driving his behavior. Apart from his criminal record and nature, everyone who knew Gacy in his hometown used to love Gacy. The cops and detectives couldn't find a single person in his town who had something to say against Gacy. He was loved by everyone, his co-workers, his neighbors, and all of associates. Gacy was considered an upstanding and a key member of his small community. He was popular and involved in politics. He used to dress like a happy clown on weekends to play with the kids. It seemed like a very nice and friendly gesture until his real face was revealed and people understood that behind his clown face was a hidden devil. There was actually something interesting about Gacy's clown face. Normally, the clowns paint their smiles with usual circular things around their lips, but Gacy's clown smile looked like bat wings. It was something. It was like he was right there trying to tell everyone his true self, but no one is understanding the language he's speaking. He really was a master of hiding in plain sight. At one point, he quite chillingly said to the detectives who were surveilling his house that clowns can get away with murder. It took some time for the detective to comprehend what he was actually saying, and yes, he was telling the truth. He literally said that he is the murderer, but the cops had no proof against him and they couldn't do anything. After doing some more investigation and questioning some of Gacy's colleagues, the cops received some disturbing and new evidence. So without any further delay, they started to push the court to issue another search warrant so they could search his house once again and confirm the evidence they had received. There were these young kids who used to work for Gacy. He used to order these kids to go down into the crawl space of his home and dig trenches. He had told them that he had some kind of a sewage issue, so he needed to fix it. Gacy's colleagues said it several times that there was this weird odor down there, which was just unbelievable. For the detectives, it sounded crazy, but still it was a huge possibility that Gacy might have buried the dead bodies of his victims down there. Everything was adding up, and gradually the cops began to assure that there had to be human bodies down there. The surveillance team was working day and night for seven days straight. They realized that the core reason for Gacy being untouchable is the local support and love he has from the people of his community. That was a real issue to break that support and bring Gacy's real face in front of everyone. So the detectives played a little mind game. The cops and the detectives began to pressurize the local people to cut the support and love for Gacy and start backing out. People fortunately listened to it and slowly Gacy was losing his support in his town. Moreover, detectives were pressuring Gacy as well about the second search warrant and they played mind games with him that made him afraid of the second search warrant. One midnight, he contacted his attorney. He rushed out of his house, got in the car and drove straight to his attorney's. The detectives, of course, followed him to the attorney's office. When the detectives reached, they saw the attorney waving them through the window to park their car and join him. Of course, it was very uncharacteristic of the attorney to do so. So in the complete state of confusion, the detectives Mike and Dave went to the attorney's office and saw that the attorney was scared to death. He was not taking his eyes off of Gacy and was completely panicked. It was now sure for the detectives that Gacy has confessed about at least three of his murders in front of his attorney. Mike and Dave didn't let Gacy go. As soon as he left his attorney's office, they followed him again. He was driving like a madman that day. He stopped at a Shell gas station. 
There, the detective saw a transaction. When Gacy left, Mike went in there to ask a few questions about Gacy. As he went inside, the cashiers inside threw a couple of marijuana bags at Mike, saying that they didn't buy it from Gacy. Rather, he gave it to us himself. This was a golden opportunity for the detectives to arrest Gacy on drug charges. They seized the opportunity and arrested John Wayne Gacy. By that time, Mike and Dave didn't have the second search warrant. They took him to the police station. While going to the police station, he was whining about why it was being done to him and what did he do. He knew exactly what was happening. He was just trying to be sly, but unfortunately it wasn't working for him. When they reached the police station, he complained of severe chest pain and was taken to the hospital to have a checkup. Upon checkup, it was revealed that he was just trying to buy some time. He was perfectly healthy. By now, on the 21st of December 1978, a second search warrant for his house was issued. This warrant was the last nail in the coffin for Gacy. The search team immediately went for the crawl space, and the very first shovel they dug they found human remains. Finally, Gacy's secrets, which he thought will remain buried forever, were being carried out on stretchers from the crawl space to the outside of his house. Gacy was arrested of murder, finally. Gacy agreed to confess everything, but in front of the surveillance team only. This was maybe a move to admit everything like a hero, because now he knew he can't get out of this. He agreed to draw a map of the burial site beneath his house. Detective Mike says, I gave him a pen and paper. He started drawing like, yeah, here's a double, here's a triple, and then put an X on the paper, saying this was the first guy, and all these X marks were spread all over the crawl space. On the map that Gacy provided, the cops went to Gacy's house again to recover all the bodies. It was unbelievable how that map was so accurate that the bodies were found exactly where Gacy had drawn those X marks. It was like a treasure hunt, and the cops had finally found the treasure. In total, 27 bodies were recovered from Gacy's crawl space. This news spread like wildfire. Within no time, everyone knew who the evil behind this happy clown was. Gacy's name was written in the record books as America's most prolific serial killer. The notion that a normal-seeming guy who's friendly and popular among people was living in this horror house with rotting bodies of 27 young men in his crawl space was blowing everyone's mind. He would bring young people to his home, torture them, sexually abuse them, kill them for his own amusement, bury them in his crawl space, and went to work the very next day like it was nothing. Upon investigation, when he was asked the question, where were you born, he replied, I was born in a state of confusion, and he smiled like he was proud of everything he had done. In total, Gacy confessed to a murder of 33 young men and boys between 1972 to 1978. 27 were buried in his crawl space. One of the kids was buried outside his backyard, and when he ran out of space on his property, he threw the remaining five bodies into the Des Plaines River. One of the bodies found floating in the Des Plaines River in April 1979 was of the poor kid Rob Pist, a 15-year-old kid whose disappearance had ultimately taken down Gacy. Gacy preyed on victims who he knew were not going to be missed by any families, or don't have any family in the first place, rootless and homeless teenage boys. But Rob was not homeless and had a family to care about his disappearance. Turned out that preying on Rob was not a good decision, and hence the downfall of John Wayne Gacy began. Gacy was very descriptive about what he had done with Rob Pist. He told the surveillance team that Rob's mom was waiting for him in the front parking lot of the pharmacy that Rob used to work at. Rob asked his mom to wait a bit while Rob wants to meet a contractor who's going to offer him a better job. Gacy was in the back parking lot sitting in his car and waiting to steer away. When Rob came and asked, Sir, I heard you have good jobs for young guys. Gacy said that he could drive him home and then they can sign the paperwork. Rob willingly got into the car and both went to Gacy's house. There, Gacy showed a couple of magic tricks to impress the kid. Mostly were card tricks, but the last trick was really mind-blowing. That was the handcuff trick. He actually handcuffed himself turned around and struggled to get his hands free. Turned around again and he pulled the handcuffs up unlocked. Rob was impressed with this trick and asked him to show him how it's done. So Gacy gave the handcuffs to Rob and asked him to handcuff himself and then he'll show him how it's done. When Rob struggled with unlocking the handcuffs, he asked Gacy, what's the trick to unlock these? Gacy then showed him the key to these handcuffs and said, you gotta have this key. Gacy had developed his signature way of killing the boys over the course of almost six years. He used to perform this handcuff trick with almost every one of the kids he brought home. And when the kids were handcuffing themselves, he used to strangle them. He had a rope, which had one end like a circular ring or loop, and had a wooden stick at the other end tied with a knot. He used to somehow slip the loop around the victim's neck and then turn the piece of wood to a point that it would eventually strangle the kids to death. He had mastered it so perfectly that he knew exactly how the body was going to react to each turn of the wooden piece. He also used chloroform to subdue his victims whenever he felt the need. Gacy somehow felt comfortable talking to the surveillance team and the detectives that he described each of his murder with all the details. 
He also confessed that there were times when he did a double or even triple. That means he killed one of his victims while he made the others watch it, and then he killed them too with the same technique. As the news of Gacy spread all over the country, a former employee of Gacy stepped up to testify against him in the court. This employee was none other than Tony Antonucci. Tony was really close to being another victim of Gacy, but luckily he got out of it and never spoke of it to anyone, as he didn't know the extent of what had happened to him. After Gacy was arrested, he testified in the court and told the authorities everything that had happened to him by the hands of Gacy. While working for PDM, Tony accidentally got a nail in his foot. Gacy took him to get a tetanus shot and later took him home. Gacy brought some wine. It was 10.30 in the night. They both were kind of enjoying themselves, talking and joking around. Tony was a high school wrestler, so Gacy started to tease him saying, so you're a strong wrestler, and gradually got hold of Tony's hands, and he handcuffed his hands behind his back and left the room for a while. Tony realized that if he pulls really hard, he can get his right hand out of the handcuffs. He then eventually took his right hand out of the handcuffs, but as Gacy returned, he acted like both of his hands were still handcuffed behind his back. When Gacy got close to him, he caught Gacy off guard, threw him on the ground, handcuffed his one hand, took the key out of his pocket to unlock his own other hand from the handcuffs, and handcuffed both Gacy's hands behind his back. While Gacy was laying on the floor, he said to Tony, You're the only one that not only got out of the handcuffs, but you got them on me. Tony didn't understand what this meant. He stood there all numb for 15 minutes, and after that he unlocked Gacy and left his house. He never spoke about this to anyone until testifying against him in the court. Tony had no idea how close he got to being another victim of this deadly killer. By the time the case went to trial, police had managed to identify the remains of 22 of the victims. Forensically, the scene of Gacy's crawl space was a nightmare. There were remains of human bodies which had been there for years. Even in the court session, the judge didn't allow anyone younger than 16 years old to be in the courtroom. It was very disturbing to even hear all of these things. Seven of Gacy's victims have never been identified. The trial of John Wayne Gacy began on the 6th of February 1980 at the Cook County Criminal Courts building in Chicago. At the time, Illinois still had the death penalty. Gacy's defense team was trying to give all of Gacy's crimes a touch of mental illness, but Gacy was not mentally ill. He was a psychopath. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew it was wrong, but he did it anyway to preserve his self-esteem and to fulfill his lust to kill. On the 13th of March 1980, the jury made a decision on the fate of John Wayne Gacy. It took them less than three hours to find Gacy guilty of all his crimes, and the judge, Louis B. Garippo, sentenced Gacy to death. In the final moments of the trial, one of the prosecutors called Gacy a ruthless, sadistic killing machine, which was exactly what he was. After the death sentence, he was taken immediately to Maynard Correctional Center in Illinois, where he would remain on death row for 14 years. While in jail, he started painting, and he used to sell his artworks and paintings for profits. The profits he made from these paintings resulted in the government suing him for his earnings. His paintings and artworks were mostly of clowns, skulls, dead bodies, and everything that you could expect of a serial killer to paint. In a CBS interview filmed in 1992, Gacy tried to deny that he was guilty of any of the murders. Throughout the interview, the interviewer grew more and more astounded by Gacy's relaxation. He didn't look nervous at all. He was absolutely composed and maybe a little angry at why I was being put through all this. This interview was the last option that Gacy opted to get out of everything, because none of his appeals or any other thing worked. Neither did this interview work. John Wayne Gacy had to die because releasing a murderer of 33 young people would not be acceptable by anyone in the country. On the 10th of May, 1994, Gacy was executed by lethal injection at Stateville Penitentiary in Illinois. During his execution, thousands of people gathered outside the penitentiary holding the signs of kill the clown, kill Gacy. People were beating drums. They were dancing. Gacy's death was a celebration for the country. When Gacy was asked if he had any last words, he replied, Kiss my ass. Those were the last words of a man who was absolutely proud of what he had done. He had no remorse for any of his 33 victims. John Wayne Gacy remains one of the most infamous killers in American history. His horrific murders continue to haunt the nation to this day. Gacy's outward persona of a charming and social person helped to keep his crimes hidden for over five years. But behind the mask of his friendly clown was a sadistic killer who brutally ended the lives of 33 young men by the most hideous of manners, all for his own selfish sexual gratification. The celebration all over the country on the day when he was executed proves that he was without a doubt one of the world's most evil killers. Well, that was it for today, guys. If you liked the video, do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.